sorry. That one? Nope. That one? Is it that one? All right, let's get started. Welcome to CS 3510. This is the second lecture of the graph algorithm unit. Today, all the audio issues have been fixed, hopefully. Uh, the topics of today's alg uh, algorithms are BFS, breadth, breadth first search, and Dijkstra's algorithm. So in general, we want to solve a problem um, that DFS is pretty bad at. Uh, and it's called the single source, sh single source shortest path. So given uh, there's many shortest path algorithms, but they solve problems in different contexts. A single source shortest path algorithm is one that you know where you're going to start, and maybe you even know where you're going to end, but you want to compute the minimum distance from you to uh, your target. Now, the way that's usually done is like you don't have any information about where your target is in relationship to you. So you, instead, you compute the shortest path from you to everything. That's why it's called a single source shortest path. This is in contrast to an algorithm which is, which is called an all pairs shortest path algorithm, which computes the minimum distance for every possible two starts and ends. Right? Now, you could compute the all pair shortest path problem, given the single source shortest path problem, by simply running the single source shortest path problem on, on each node. And then you take the mins of everything. But it's actually faster if you have a special algorithm for all pair shortest paths. And we'll talk about all pair shortest paths next week. But today, we're just simply going to talk about uh, the single source shortest path algorithm. Right? So uh, the only graph algorithms we've seen so far are DFS and variants of DFS. And by the way, by shortest path, what do we mean? We mean uh, a sequence of edges, weighted or unweighted, that gets you from point A to point B. And if the edges are unweighted, we're, the shortest path is the minimum number of edges. If they're weighted, it's the minimum sum of the edges. right? Everyone has used Google Maps, and then you, it gives you like a couple routes, and then you click on the one that has less traffic or whatever. right? That's just a single source shortest path algorithm, because it tells you where you're going to start. Um, so the only algorithms we know so far are DFS, depth for search, and variants of, of DFS. Um, but DFS does not work well for the single source shortest path problem. Here's a quick counterexample in the unweighted setting. So if you, the shortest, the shortest uh, uh, A to D path is 1, right? You can go from, you start from A, you end at D, one edge. Easy. However, uh, DFS uh, will return, it'll go 1, 2, 3, right? So DFS may take you the long way around. DFS goes really, really deep. And then maybe you could have ad adjacent nodes uh, that may be close together, but DFS may reach them at different times during its, uh, its execution. And it may say they're actually very far apart. So DFS is not an algorithm for shortest paths. And in fact, if you see like on a problem or anything, if it says something about shortest paths, you should immediately start thinking about problems related to BFS and Dijkstra's algorithm, and not about problems related to DFS. DFS solves topological sort, strongly connected components, uh, cycle finding, all these other kinds of problems. But BFS, will, BFS and Dijkstra's algorithm will solve the uh, shortest path problem. Right? So let's talk about what BFS does. What we want to do is visit a node, and then visit all nodes to currently visited nodes. That's simply what BFS does. So let's just implement it. We're going to have some G and some start vertex. Uh, we'll call it S for each. Uh, u in v, a dist of u takes on infinity. Right? So what does this mean? You First, you set the distance to every node to be infinity. And by infinity, we simply mean here some sort of max int number. You're going to compare distances. 
And you're going to update them based on if they're shorter, which one's shorter. Um, and if a node hasn't been visited, you can think that its distance currently known is infinity. But what that means is when you perform the comparison, the first actual path you compute will definitely be less than infinity. So the comparison will always fall on the, the side of the, sh the shortest path that you just discovered in the case that you've never visited the node before. Um, uh, we're going to set the start to be 0. And then we're simply going to make a queue. And I'm going to call it capital Q. And we're going we're gonna to push s into the queue um, while the queue is not uh, empty. Uh, U takes on eject. So we're going to eject something from the front of the queue. Uh, and then for each of its outgoing edges, inject uh, each of its neighbors, and then update their distance. That's all BFS is. So let's recall what a queue does. A queue is you put things in it, and then you take things out of it, like any other data structure. But you take things off the front of the queue, and you append things to the back of the queue. So if you think of it like a line, you enter from here, and then you exit from here. Right? So you push things into the queue, and then you pop things off the, uh, off the front of the queue. Right? Push things go in the back, pop things off the front. That's sort of the notation we use. Um, this is in contrast, really, to a stack. Right? The DFS takes heavy abuse of the stack frame structure as a stack data structure. But uh, BFS, in contrast, uses a queue. And these are also kind of like dual data structures, right? So it makes sense that BFS and DFS have a duality. So should um, uh, the st because the stack and the queue have this duality, so should, the sh so should BFS and DFS, right? And let's just quickly, we'll do several examples of it. But if we were to do it in this one, what we would do is we would first set this one to 0, and we'd set these to infinity, right? And then what we're going to do is pop A off the queue and push its uh, neighbors and then update them to the distance of a plus one, uh, plus one, right? Then you pop something off the queue. It's going to be b, and you push its neighbor plus one. Then you pop uh, what's left in the queue. It's going to be d. You pop that off the queue. None of its neighbors have been uh, two. You, you you would check. You would update it to be one plus one is two. And you see has no neighbors, and then you pop that off, and you're done, right? Let's do a more detailed example. But you kind of see how every node, its neighbors farther from the source are going to be its own distance plus 1, right? Uh, a is 0, B and D are 1, and then C is 2, because C is 2 away from A. That's the, the heart of the algorithm. So let's do another uh, quick example. Right, suppose we want to start with s, right? So we're going to start with the queue with just s in it, right? The queue is initialized with the start with the start vertex, and while it's not empty, we're going to push and pop to it. So we eject an element from uh, the queue, and then we, uh, if it's not visited, then we inject it into the queue, right? So we're going to pop s from the queue, which is distance is currently zero, and we're going to inject, and these all distances are infinity, right? And we're going to inject uh, its neighbors. So those, those are going to look like we pop s, and we're going to push a, c, e. Right? That's the, that's the snapshot of the queue. Then uh, these are going to all update to 0 plus 1, which is 1. Right? Then uh, what are we going to do? We're going to just continue popping things off the queue, adding 1 and pushing its neighbors. Yes? Oh. Yeah. 
Thank you. We're going to pop something off the queue and then push its neighbors. So we're going to pop A off the queue and push its neighbors. Its neighbors, uh, but we're only going to inject the neighbors that have not been seen before. The neighbors that we haven't seen of A is going to be B. So we're going to push B into the queue and update it. So it's going to be C, D, E, B. And it's going to be 1 plus 1 is 2, right? Then we're going to pop C off the queue, but we've already visited B, so we're not going to look at it again. Oh, we did forgot to update this, right? Did we? Yeah, it's supposed to be one, right? We pop D off the queue. It has no unvisited neighbors. We're going to pop E off the queue and note that it is no unvisited neighbors. And then we pop B off the queue, noting it has no unvisited neighbors. And then we stop. Right? We kind of see how BFS works. The correctness of it should be obvious. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, uh, that's just actually Dijkstra's algorithm. So wait till the second half of the lecture. Um, what's the runtime of BFS? Let's talk about that. If you have, um, well, each vertex is pushed into the queue once and popped out the queue once, right? So in terms of the number of the vertices, at least it's linear time. Each vertex is visited, is looked at once, right? Um, each edge is looked at once as well. And in the undirected sense, it's actually looked at twice from both ends. Then you decide whether or not you, you do something. But each edge is at least looked at once in a directed sense and looked at twice in the undirected sense. But that's still just linear in the number of edges. So actually, the runtime of uh, BFS is going to be V plus E, which happens to also be the same runtime as DFS. So DFS and BFS, purely theoretical, do take the same runtime. Now, does that mean you should not choose one over the other and that you, you, you should make a decision on that? Uh, no. If you just need to loop over your graph, maybe it might not matter. But in a lot of contexts, which algorithm you choose does matter quite a lot. Um, even though they, in the purely theoretical sense, they do have the same runtime. Two points to this. First is like. BFS only solves shortest path problems. So if you need shortest path problems, uh, use BFS. If you have any of the other problems that look like strongly connected components, that look like cycle finding, that look like topological sort, maybe use DFS. Uh, and two, sometimes you know something about your graph structure that will make BFS faster than DFS or vice versa. Right? For example, let's say you know the answer is really close to the start, but you simply do not know where. And let's say your graph is really, really deep, so that DFS would take a long time to come back and find something close. Um, then you probably want to use BFS, right? Sometimes the answer is next to you, but you just don't know in which direction. In that sense, BFS is a much more optimal choice. Purely theoretical, they take the same time. There's at least one onion problem where if you try to use DFS instead of BFS, it won't work, even though they have the same runtime, just because you know that the answer can only be is, is within a certain distance of you, right? All right, let's do another example. Any questions on this one? Yeah? That's a great question. And actually, the correctness of BFS can also be explained more through the correctness of Dijkstra's algorithm. But basically, like um, BFS always has some, and, and Dijkstra's also to an extent. Dijkstra's, turns out, is just going to be a weighted version of BFS, which is why I think it's such a beautiful algorithm. But BFS sort of maintains a known region, right? It's think of like uh, DFS, like lightning, right? It just kind of goes really deep, and then it comes back, and then it does whatever, right? But BFS is sort of like a like when you drop a rock in a puddle, and then it goes like here, and then there's some set of nodes that it knows about, and then it, some set no more. And what happens is it sort of increases the known area currently, right? So there's some set of vertices that have been in and out of the queue. And there is a new vertice here that has an edge. So there is some vertex in, that has been visited that's in the queue. 
And there's some vertex that has not yet been visited out of the queue. And basically, it does that, and then it sort of increases the known area, right? Like that. Um, but if there is a longer path with more edges, simply by the fact that it's longer, we'll see this one first, just because of the way the queue works, right? We will t still see this edge, but we'll see it after we explore everything else, right? Because you're going outside in, you're going, excuse me, inside out, you're going like this, that's why it finds the shortest path. Absolutely, absolutely. Notice that we didn't up, we went to B how? We went through A, and then we went through C, right? But notice that it's the same anyway, right? We wouldn't, let's say, let's say there was somehow an extra node here or something. Suppose, right? We would have gone A would have been one, that node would have been two, and this would have been three. This would have been one and two. We would have found A and C. Then we would have found these two at the same time, right? So then it, it, when you look at this one and this one, that would have, you wouldn't have had to update it, because you would have come this way faster than you go this way. It races in all directions equally, right? Is a question? Yeah. Oh, great question, great question. There's always a difference between the value and the actual path itself. This simply writes down the numbers, but it doesn't tell you what the actual shortest path to get there is. And the answer is you simply keep an extra data structure of back pointers. A lot of times when we present the algorithms, we're going to only talk about the numerical value and assume that it's, it's known a way to store the actual answer. And the, the way you would do this is you would simply keep a back pointer, a set of, uh, an array of back pointers. So it would look something like prev of b would be set to a. So you would keep a set of pointers, so like, and then you could look through this array backwards. So you know that the shortest path from S to B goes through A. By when you set this distance, you set the previous of B to be the one that you're currently at, which is A. Right? And then A, prev of A, is going to be S. So then you can compose those, you can actually get the shortest path back out. Right? Well, when we do Dijkstra's, I'll explain that as well in more detail. More questions on this BFS example before we get to another one? Right, and let's start the, let's perform BFS, but we'll start with A, right? So A is going to be zero, and all of these are going to be set to uh, infinity. And again, infinity isn't real on a computer, it's simply like some max int or something. Some denoted value, you override the comparison operator or whatever. Right? So following the algorithm, you pop A off the queue and you push its neighbors. Uh, and then if they haven't been visited, you excuse me, if you if they haven't been visited, then you push them into the queue. So you're gonna push B and F, right? You're gonna update this to be one. Zero plus one, you're gonna update that to be one, right? Um, why do you push B first before F first? The, Graph has a lot of structure and order to it, but there just has to be a way to deal break which way you do things. So here, it, when we present it on the board, we just do it alphabetically. There is always a way to say this edge in a tiebreaker has to come before that edge. So because and every array is ordered, or however the vertices are stored, so you just follow whatever order it is, as long as it's consistent. And you, can't, you don't insert two things at once, right? Um, next, what you're going to do is pop B off the queue. And up, uh, it has an unvisited neighbor, so you're going to update that to 1 plus 1, which is 2. Right? Now you're going to pop f off the queue, and it has two unvisited neighbors, which are c and g. 
So you're going to push those to the Q, which is so the Q is going to be E, C, G. And you're going to update these to 1 plus 1, which is 2. right? Um, now you're going to pop E off the Q. E has no unvisited neighbors. Uh, then you're going to pop C off the Q, and it has, an, it has exactly one unvisited neighbor, which is D. So the distance of D is going to go from infinity to 2 plus 1, which is 3. And then you're going to pop G off the Q. G has one unvisited neighbor, which is H. So this is going to be uh, 2 plus 1, which is 3. And then you're going to push H into, H into the Q. So it's going to be DH. D has no unvisited neighbors. H has no unvisited neighbors. Right. And again, we see that the shortest path from A to D was 3. And we happen to go from F to C to, to D. Right? Yes? Um, because the, 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 we wrote down a 3 next to the D. So you keep a value, a set of values here, which is this dist array. And it will just contain the numbers. And the D of, dist of D will store the number, which is the shortest path from the start to D. Well, every pair, every, every vertice has a shortest distance from A. There's a shortest distance from A to B, from A to E, from A to F. All those are different values. And the value of, of a specific vertex, let's say D, will be stored at dist D. Yeah. Um, another thing we can note here about uh, the sort of water-like property of BFS, uh, the way it sort of seems to create a, a wave, is simply the, if you look at the Q, right? If you think about arranging uh, DFS into like a, what it looks like on a tree or something, so if you were to run DFS on this, Right? Uh, excuse me, if you were on BFS on this, it would see A, A, S, and then it would look at A, uh, B, and then C, and then it would look at D, just because of the way you push things into the Q. Uh, but notice that D, DFS would immediately jump to D, even though BFS would not. And if you think about arranging your graph with it hanging at S as a root, um, it has this really nice property is that you have to get through all of the children in the queue before you get to the grandchildren. All of the children must be visited before you see a grandchild, right? So S can immediately, you could technically go immediately to D here. You don't, though. You, you are forced to go through BC. You visit all of your children before you visit any single grandchild, right? We see that through uh, BFS, right? All right, more questions on this example before we get to the weighted sense? We all understand BFS. We've all seen this somewhere pre previously. All right, what about weighted graphs or even weighted directed graphs? We want to solve the single source shortest path problem for directed graphs, right? What that means is we have, again, some set of vertices set up in a graph with edges, but the edges now have directions and also weight. So perhaps that means something like this. Right. So there, what's the shortest path from S to B? It's actually not going straight to B, but it's going through A, right? So it can be, depending on the weights, uh, solving this problem is not easy, because you don't want to just go to the next edge, right? You don't want to just say, well, uh, I, obviously there's one edge between S and B, so I'm simply going to take that one. But no, because actually there's a shorter path. Maybe that edge being 200 is calculated because the road is really rocky or really curvy or something, right? Um, this is an example from the DPV book, but there's actually something particular about this triangle. There's something special and illegal about this triangle. Um, well, that's not illegal. Uh, 
there is a cycle, but that's okay. This is not really a, a, a serious question, but I just want to see if anyone noticed it. That's okay. A triangle can have unequal side lengths, right? This is called the triangle inequality. If you think about it, the, the, the lens of, in the Euclidean plane, the sum of the two sides have to be greater than the third, right? This isn't true in graphs, because graphs, we don't care about the literal position of vertices, but we simply maintain that information through the uh, a weighted edge. But this is an example of a graph that you actually couldn't draw. You couldn't draw. Uh, an actual 100 centimeters, 200 centimeters, and 50 centimeters between those two on a sheet of paper, right? The sum of any two sides of a triangle must be greater than the third side. But 150 pl 100 plus 150 is not greater than 200. So this actually violates the triangle inequality. So maybe this triangle is so big that the edge that's 200 has to wrap around the other side of the equator or something, right? And then actually S and A are really close to each other on this side, something like this. I don't know. Um, all right, so let's solve the problem. Before you determine uh, a good answer, you should always think of a bad answer. Every problem has uh, always a brute force or a terrible solution to it. And it won't work, but it'll help you maybe understand some structure about the problem. So what we're going to do is replace each uh, edge by a sequence of edges. Right? So we replace each edge of weight 100 by uh, 100 edges and 99 nodes. Um, OK, now BFS will work on this to determine the shortest path. right? And the value uh, it gives will also be the shortest path. How does this work? Well, BFS is going to first, if you start from S, it's going to first find these two nodes. Then it's going to find these two nodes. Then it's going to find these two nodes. right? That's the way BFS is going to do. Each update of the BFS will pop those two off the queue, push the next two off the push the next two into the queue. And eventually, the top one, with this being 100 and this being 50, uh, this being 200, you'll be like here. At the same time, you'll be like here, right? And then eventually, you're going to hit this from this direction before you hit it from this direction, right? By the BFS properties. Now, this is kind of a really bad algorithm, but it does explain quite a lot of the structure of the way it works. Why is this really bad? Well, now, like, I mean, besides the cost of insertion and all this stuff, like, uh, the comparison between the two edges is made um, not in terms, of the, in terms of the number itself instead of the representation of the number. So we assume that the graph is represented in V plus E because of the adjacency list representation. BFS and DFS both run in linear time. But uh, the edges are assumed to be fixed point um, arithmetic, like 32-bit numbers, uh, just so we don't have to have a really ugly looking runtime. But if we suppose we didn't, the way you what is the complexity to compare two n-bit numbers? O of n, yeah. And you actually can't even do better than that. But this takes as a number of steps, not n if n, is the nu if n is the number of bits of the number. It doesn't take n. It takes 2 to the n time to do this. So you have to, I mean, like, imagine you were trying to compare 7 and 4. Instead of comparing their bits, you say, OK, I'm going to first compare 6 and 3, and then I'm going to compare 5 and 2, and then I'm going to compare 4 and 1, and then I'm going to compare 3 and 0, and then, oh, look, that one's a 0, so obviously 3 is greater. Like, no one does it that way, obviously. Um, but that's essentially what this algorithm is doing. So let's just cut out that part. 
And notice that we do know that it will reach A before it reaches B from, the, from start. We do know that A will be reached before B, right? Why do we know that? Because 100 is less than 200. So if you consider any start vertex, and you consider its outgoing edges, one of them will be reached first if you were to convert it this way. But instead of actually just putting in uh, uh, 100 edges and then 200 edges, all you have to do is simply compare 100 with 200 and choose A over B. That's basically all Dijkstra's algorithm does, right? What is the first thing you see in your queue? It's going to be something that was last pushed, right? It's something that made its way all the way through the queue. But you, th the next thing you visit is going to be the thing that was last visited in BFS. Or previously, it had to make its way all the way through the queue. Instead, all Dijkstra's does is simply implement a weighted version of BFS, where instead of a queue, you use a min pri priority queue. So the, the, the thing that you're going to pull out of the queue is simply going to be the minimum current distance. So you're going to, ins you're going to keep um, You're still going to keep some known region. So that's your start. Let's say this is your known region. This is the set of vertices you visited. And let's say there's two edges only outgoing from your thing. Let's say this one is 20 and this one is 30, right? Well, you know these two. Let's call this A. Let's call this B. What you're going to do is to you're going to choose the, 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 the vertex that's closest to your known region, that has an edge. One edge is in your known region. One edge is out of your known region. But the edge is minimal. So you're going to first you're going to visit A before you visit B. So the known region will increase this way before it hits B. Then B will eventually be hit when it's its time when it's the shortest edge. Maybe we find some other path to it through, through some other way. But that's basically all Dijkstra's algorithm does. It simply prioritizes the edges. It's just BFS, but it prioritizes the edges not through the number of edges, but simply the weight on the edges. Right? Given that. Simple explanation, it probably is enough to implement it, but let's go ahead and do it. Uh, def Dijkstra's. Um, it's going to take on uh, G L is going to be a, a. So how do you encode a graph? You encode it as an array list, uh, right? Of the uh, the the adjacency lists of the you V lists each containing the outgoing edges of that. But then how do you encode a weighted graph? One way you could do it is you could put it in the adjacency list itself. Like just a tuple, fine. For the algorithm, we're going to store it separately just for clarity. It's going to be in a uh, dictionary called L. And L, you give it two vertices, it'll give you the weight of, the, of that edge. right? Um, so L and then S. And you guys remember the operations on a priority queue? Do you guys remember what a priority queue is? A priority queue, um, so there's multiple implementations of it. And you probably know this extensively from your data structures course. There's the binary heap. You can even trivially use an array. There's Dairy heap, there's a Fibonacci heap, there's a binomial heap, and all these other things. But it supports the following basic operations. Uh, it inserts insertion, uh, decrease key, uh, delete min, and make queue. So insertion, right? you have a priority queue. You can add a vertex into the priority queue. Decrease key, if you have a specific vertex in mind, you can update its distance. You can update the key. So it'll maybe you want to minimize it, so it'll move to the front. Uh, delete min, it simply removes the smallest element in the queue. right? Uh, and what does that actually look like when, if you think of the binary uh, heap? right? There's some sort of tree arrangement such that the, the children of every node are less than the node. So the property that that gives is that the minimum is the root. So when you delete it, you simply like pop off the root, and then you do the whole rearranging thing. And then that'll make the next min 
come to the root, right? You guys maybe vaguely remember this. Not a data structures course. We're going to sort of use a priority queue in a black box way, and then we'll discuss the runtime of Dijkstra's in terms of the operations needed for a priority queue. Everyone remember a priority queue? Any questions on the on the structure of the black box way we're to interact with a priority queue? Yeah. Oh, okay. Any questions? Priority queue. Everyone remember that? Okay. Good. It's just a queue, but you can think get rearranged to be in the front. Yeah. Uh, decrease key. So let's say there's some minimum distance to some vertex u that's 10, but then you found a shorter path that's 4. You want to update the shortest stored path of u to be from 10 to 4, and that may move u towards the front of the queue. So it'll update the key that that vert element is stored at, and per perhaps moving it to the front or near the front. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so make queue. Um, Usually is not defined in lots of other places, but make queue basically like you could make a queue by taking a blank queue and then inserting it v times. That works, but so actually it's faster if you don't do that. You can still bar for many implementations, given a starting set of values, it's faster. To, and what are we going to start with? We're going to start with zero and infinities, right? So instantiating the queue is much faster than doing insertions. Because if you recall binary heap, inserting, inserting things have to balance and rebalance and stuff, and it takes a, a, it takes v times like log v, I think, for the for the make if to to insert v times. But then if you just instantiate it, it takes v time. Turns out something like this. Um, right. More questions on the queue implementation before we get to the algorithm? Yeah. Correct. Decrease key, so each value in the priority queue, and the queue, the, the precedence of the elements are simply how close they are to the front of the queue. But in a priority queue, you can rearrange the priority of elements by decreasing their key. And let's not even, we don't need to ever increase the key, so don't even think about that. But given a certain node, it's maybe its value is 10. But if we find a shorter path to it that has value 4, we want to increase its priority in the queue. So we push it to the front by decreasing its key from 10 to 4. All right. OK, um, let's get to the algorithm. Uh, so for each uh, u in v, uh, dist of u is going to take on infinity, and the prev of u is going to take on null. Recall prev is an array of back pointers. So like given some vertex, what is the short what is backwards on the way to the shortest path to the start, which is going to be s, I set prev to be nothing so far, right? Um, we're going to set distance of the start, of course, to be uh, zero, and then we're going to make the queue. And the keys are going to be done with the dist values. Right? So uh, right. So you want the shortest node currently that's going to be there. That's going to be at the front of the queue. right? And that's why the queue is keyed by the disk values. Uh, while the queue is not empty, Now here, delete min is sort of the DQ operation. It pops the smallest thing off. And that, all, that operation also performs all the rearranging. We're just going to call that element u. And then for each of its neighbors, if we found a shorter path from each of its neighbors to everything, uh, then we update that. If dist of v is greater than dist of u, plus the length of uv, dist of v takes on dist of u plus l of u comma v. We're going to set the back pointer of v to be coming from u. And we're going to decrease key.
right? So basically, how does this algorithm work? As it explores, it finds temporary shortest paths to certain vertices until there is a minimum shortest path, and then it's popped on the queue and then not looked at again. But if you think about the execution of this, there are multiple paths to a node, right? And it simply will find the shortest one. So let's say you're at some start S, and you're at, um, here's some V. And let's say V, you had updated its shortest path to come from somewhere else. Uh, this is the current value of dist V, right? We'll call this 100. So maybe there's some nodes on the way there, right? This is going to be U, and this is going to be some shortest path of dist U. Let's call this 20. Um, this is going to be a single edge. So this is a, the way squiggly line represents a path, the straight line represents an edge, right? So there's some shortest path from S to U and some shortest path from S to V, right? So if, and let's call this, I don't know, 15. So if uh, 20 plus 15 is less than 100, and it is, then you say dist of v takes on the 20 plus 15. Right? So currently, there is some shortest path to v, which is marked as 100. But if you come around and you find a shorter path, then you say, no, the shortest path no longer to v is going to go through whatever node's here. It's going to go through u. The shortest, it, we updated at this point to say the shortest path from s to v is going through u. That's really the heart of Dijkstra's algorithm. Right? Any question? We'll get, we'll get to some examples, but any questions on just the implementation or the correctness or anything about that? Yeah? Yeah. Distance v? Yeah. Right. So, like, um, like here you update it from distance of v goes from 100 to 35, right? But that may make it the sh next smallest vertex. So, you want to push that to the front of the line. Because it's it's it it its number went smaller, so it's it's uh, gets to cut ahead, right? Previous is a set of back pointers. So, for example, by setting pre v to be u, we know that the shortest path from v to the start must go through u. So you simply backtrack, and then you take the shortest path from y of u. Prev u will be some other vertex, which will be some other vertex, will be some other vertex, will get to the start. So, in fact. Uh, when we do the example, I'll also draw what the prev array looks like when we compute dextrous. Any more questions on just the algorithm or its correctness? Yeah? What? It depends. So we're using priority queue in a black box way just so we can have these four operations. And then depending on what priority queue implementation you use, the runtime of Dijkstra's algorithm will change. That's, not, that's unlike any algorithm we've seen yet. Because every algorithm, you just write a big O of something. Here, the big O depends on the implementation of the priority queue. right? So the binary heap is like a sane and safe one. But actually, sometimes for dense graphs, the array is going to be just fine. In a special case, maybe the Fibonacci heap, maybe the Dieri heap. You know, it, it depends. So the answer is it depends. right? But certainly, you can believe that you could implement any priority queue data structure. Dijkstra's on any priority queue data structure. right? More questions on the, on the correctness? Let's talk about the correctness of the algorithm. Why does it actually find the shortest path? So it finds several paths from, a, uh, as, as it performs, it grows a known area exactly like BFS. Uh, but it's biased towards not the edges themselves, but the weights of the edges. So it will find all paths through to a vertex v. And how do we know that we found the minimal one is simply because it's the minimal of all the current paths so far. Because you don't you stop looking at a node simply when it's popped off of the priority queue. So when it's popped off the priority queue, it's the min of all current distances that are being looked at and maintained. So that means that you found the shortest path for it. Because all the other ones have to have longer paths, right? Let's say your queue, priority queue was like V was 10, and then I don't know, U. Uh, w, this was like 15 and 20, right? There cannot be a shorter path from u to v through the graph because the shortest path we've maintained is currently 10. The shortest path through u has to be more than 15. So there is no shortest path to v through u because 10 is less than 15. 
So by the time the vertex comes all the way to the front of the queue, its shortest path has been computed, and that is the shortest path, right? Now, every problem, every algorithm that's efficient, so every problem ever has, well, most of them, have a brute force, trivial, terrible solution. But any advanced algorithm that takes good advantage, any good algorithm has to take advantage of the structure of the way the problem is phrased. Right? Every problem has some sort of structure, and an efficient algorithm takes advantage of that structure. So one thing to note immediately, there's two things to note. First, Dijkstra's does not work on negative edge weights. The comparisons simply don't hold up. Right? Think of a negative edge weight as you may be willing to go out of the way to then take a negative edge and come back. But that violates this property. Right? If, if, there was a, if negative edges were allowed, there might be a shortest path to v from u if there's a negative edge of 100 or something. Right? We'll talk about negative edges uh, later, and there are some algorithms for them. They're much worse. So it doesn't work with negative edges. But that's part of the beauty and efficiency of Dijkstra's algorithm is that it's not even clear why it, why it relies on positive edge weights, but it simply does. And it, it, in words, we can describe it as the property, the shortest. Oh, thank you. The shortest uh, S to T path is less than is uh, less than or equal to the shortest uh, S uh, U T path for all U, right? So S U T path is a path that goes from S to U to T. So it's a pa ST path that specifically goes through U. Uh, the shortest ST path is going to be less than or equal to the shortest SUT path for all U, right? Kind of trivial of a statement, but if you think about it, that's a huge structure of graph problems. And that makes that's where the efficiency of Dijkstra's algorithms come from. Yes? Uh, actually, so when I took 3510, I had the exact same question. And there's a counterexample to this. Uh, it's like, it's got like five or six nodes, though. So I'll leave it to you to try and find. That sounds obvious, because simply you're making comparisons of numbers. So simply raising the comparison floor, it seems like it would work. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Right? Um, this property is also why. Uh, not just the efficiency of Dijkstra's algorithm, but the correctness, right? How does it actually? Why does it actually find the shortest ST path? And this is why it just goes. It checks all the path. It finds the shortest ST path by trying all the U's that have passed along the way to S all, from S all the, on the way to T, right? Um, let's do an example, and then we'll talk about the runtime. More basic questions on Dijkstra's algorithm before we see the example. Right. So we'll consider we have this graph, right? Um, and like BFS, we're going to initialize everything to be the start. We're going to initialize to be zero, and then everything else will initialize to be infinity. Right. Now you've made your queue. You simply pop off the smallest queue, and you push uh, the edges the distance less. So this C is simply going to update uh, to be 2, because it's going to be 0 plus 2, which is 2. And this B is simply going to update to be 4, 
is 0 plus uh, uh, 4 is 4, right? The, really, the difference here between Dijkstra's and BFS, again, is that, uh, oh, this is BFS. Uh, instead of adding 1, like you do in uh, BFS, you add the length of the edge, right? You can see similarities in the algorithms. Um, right now, what are we going to do? Our, our priority queue, we popped off A and we pushed its children. So we're going to, uh, we, we've updated the keys of C and B. So the, the, the smallest key is going to be C. So we're going to pop off C off the queue and we're going to push, and we're going to update all of its outgoing edges. So we notice that, well, 2 plus 1 is 3. So actually, you can get to f B going through. Uh, C than you can going from A, right? So we're going to update this to be uh, 3. And actually, let me just keep track of the back pointers while we do this. Right? So the shortest path through uh, to, from A to B, there used to be a, a prev here. But after resetting it, we get rid of that and we set this edge, right? The shortest, the, the prev of B is going to be C and no longer A, right? Now we're going to take the minimum on the Q, which is going, and we pop C off the Q, its shortest path is fixed. So the minimum, uh, oh, we have some more to do out of C actually. C is going to have a value of 3 here and infinity, so we're going to take infinity, and it's going to be 2 plus 3, which is going to be 5. 2 plus 5, 7. Right? Double checking, I'm not missing any edges. Yep. Here's another property that negative uh, edge weighted graphs have, but uh, positive, non negative, it's going to be positive edge weighted graphs don't. They're, what's the shortest path from C to C? It's simply staying there, right? That's not true in an edge weighted cycle, a negative edge weighted cycle, right? Because there is a path from C to B to C, and if one of those was negative, there is a, the shortest path from C to itself would simply be negative infinity. You can go something and come back and come back and come back, right? Negative, very, negative edge weighted graphs sound very similar. Very, very difficult problem, very different problem. Um, so now we have uh, the shortest path we have, and we'll update these. So that's our current prev uh, array. The shortest path currently from uh, D is to, from A to D is going to go through C. Now we need to take the shortest one uh, of here, and it's going to be well. We popped, we looked, we deleted C off the min queue, but we haven't deleted B, D, or E yet. So we're going to delete B off the min queue because it's got a value of three, and we're going to compare it to each one. So we see two plus three is five. Now five is already a length five, so we could choose not to change it. But the way we've defined the algorithm is we have a less than uh, a greater than operation, right? Is only when we update it. So we can leave that. Right? It doesn't matter, actually, if you update it or not update it. Let's just not update it, because 2 plus 3 is 5. It's already 5. Um, then what else? There's an edge to C. So that would be 3 plus 3, but, we've, but that's way more than it, so we're not going to do that. Uh, but then we have 3 plus 4, which is 7, which is also here, which is also 2 plus 5, so we're also not going to update that one. So we just pop B off the Q and don't update anything. Now, what is the shortest path? Uh, the, 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 the two elements that are still in the queue are going to be D and E. We're going, the minimum, the, the keys have been updated. The smallest key is going to be uh, D. Yeah? The algorithm, is, the C is not going to be in the queue, but you're going to just check the edge. The way that, oh, wait. The way the algorithm is defined is you pop it off the queue, and you, then you check for each. But you won't update it it's, if it's not in the queue. Yeah. When I like to write algorithms on the board, I like to write them as simple and clean pseudocode as possible. But know that there's many little edge cases, right? Um, all that stuff you got to handle, right? Including also uh, abstracted away from it, this, the array, li the JNC list representation of the graph. I didn't. Even, that's not even said implicitly or anything. It, it's totally implicit, but that's behind the interface, right? Okay. Uh, D is the smallest one, so we're gonna up. We're gonna consider all of D's outgoing edges. And it's going to actually be um, it's going to be uh, it has no outgoing edges actually. So it's going to be nothing. And then we're going to pop e off the queue, and that's going to be nothing. So actually, that's going to be the uh, minimum. That's going to be the set of previous edges that explores it, right? 
Now, what if instead we had not considered the, uh, we, we had several cases actually where the shortest distance was equal. So what would happen had we tried to update those paths instead? This, it ends up being the same path, but what would it look like, just out of curiosity? The shortest path from A to B would have still gone through C, and the shortest path from A to C would have been, of course, direct. But then the shortest paths through D and E would not have gone through C, because we would have updated them. So they would have actually gone through B, right? So these two shortest paths actually are equivalent in this example. But uh, this is what the prev array looks like, right? The shortest path from, in this, if this is the way you, you know, broke the cards, the shortest path through D would be A, C, B, D. Yes? Oh. Four plus two. Wait, two plus one is three plus two is five, so seven. Two plus five is seven. No. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Only numbers I know are zero, one, and n. Anything else is uh, right. Um, OK, so we kind of see how Dijkstra's algorithm works, and it sort of grows the area. Because you notice that it biased choosing nodes at the front of the queue. The min of Q is the one that we looked at first. Those are the ones that have their shortest path fixed. And then we choose if it's neighbors, right? Let's, uh, let's do another example, and we'll discuss the runtime. Questions on this example? Any mistakes? So we're going to set s to be 0, and we'll set, uh, maybe I'll just write it here, s, t, x, y, and then z. S, what? Oh, thank you. Uh, please follow along and make sure I don't make any small addition mistakes, right? So we're going to, uh, I can get rid of that now, OK? Um, so Dijkstra's algorithm, we're going to pop s off. The, the shortest distance from s to s is, of course, nothing. Question? But it's already 5. 2 plus 3 is also 5. This is an example where there's multiple shortest paths. So e either one is OK. okay. Following exactly the way Dijkstra's algorithm is implemented, this one, you don't update the path if it's equal, only if it's less than. So this is the one that should have returned correctly. This is just an example had we chosen to update it. Yeah? It's too early for you guys. So if there is a mistake, though, please let me know. Right? OK. Um, all right. Uh, what are we going to do? We're going to update the shortest distance. s is going to be 0. But we're going to compare infinity with, in, uh, with 0 plus 10. So that's going to be 10. And we're going to compare infinity with 0 plus 5, which is going to be 5. And these are going to remain as infinity, right? Uh, then we're the shortest path we, wait, x? Yeah. OK. The shortest path now to where the, sh the, the min one is going to be y, so we're going to look at its. We know that that's the shortest path is definitely 5 from s to y, undeniably so. Now let's look at the shortest paths coming out of y, which are going to go to what? t, x, and z. 
The shortest path to t is going to be, so this is going to be 0, this is going to be 5. The shortest path to t, we're going to compare 10 with 5 plus 3, which is 8, which is less than it, so we're going to update that to 8. Yeah? Oh, yeah, I don't even, yeah, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Good catch. Thank you. OK. This, the minimum after uh, one update is going to be 5. We're going to look at 5. We're going to compare 5 plus 3, which is going to be 8. We're going to compare um, 7 with 5 plus 2, which is going to be 7. So we don't, t we don't update this one. And then we have an outgoing edge from y to x. We're going to compare 5 plus 9 with the current stored value of x, which is infinity. So what is 5 plus 9? 14? We know this one is fixed. We know this one is fixed. Um, the minimum now is going to be z. So we look at the outgoing edges of z, which is going to be 6, and that's it. So the outgoing edge of 6 is to x. So what's the shortest path from uh, z to x? It's going to be the value of z, which is going to be 7 plus 6, which is 13. And 13 is less than 14. So this is going to become 13. This is going to remain as 7 because that was the minimum, and we take that one off. And then t, there's no edge incoming to t this round, so it, it stays the same. We're going to take the minimum again, which is going to be uh, one that we haven't looked at yet. So it's going to be 8. We already looked at z, We popped z off the priority queue. Uh, so we're going to look at t. I think we only have t and x left. So we're going to look at t. Is there a shortest path from uh, its outgoing edges are to y? So t plus 2 is going to be 10 to y. We're not going to update that at all. Uh, t to x is going to be 8 plus 1 is 9, but the current value of x is 13. So this is 9. So x is going to become 9, and these are going to stay the same. right? This 9 comes from what? It comes from 1 plus the 8, which is going to be the 5 and the 3. right? Those three edges are the shortest path from x to y. In a complex graph, it's not obvious to see that. The shortest, like looking at it, if you had to guess the short, shortest path, you, went, you might not have found that one first. You might not have found it going 5 to 3 to 1, right? But that's what Dijkstra's does. Uh, and then we're done. So nothing is, everything's popped off the, well, we still have to pop uh, uh, x off the queue, actually. So we pop x off the queue. It has an outgo outgoing edge of 4. And 9 plus 4 is? 13 and z is 7, so we and we already popped that one off, so it's not going to work. So done. One thing left in the queue, we're done. Right. We all see the execution of Dijkstra. Any mistakes made? Any questions on the execution before we get to the runtime? Yeah. No. So I did it just anyway. But actually, you, if something has been popped out of the queue, it's never going to be updated again. Its minimum distance has already been computed. That's done. But I didn't just look, doing it on the board, I didn't realize that. The computer will know that, but I didn't. So I just had to like, remember that. So, And of course, you won't update it, because by the correctness of Dijkstra's algorithm, since it's been popped out of the queue, the distance will be, le will be greater. It won't, definitely won't be less than, right? Questions on this example before we get to the runtime? So different priority queue impl implementations have different runtimes. You could do the array, the vanilla way, and then you can do the binary heap. These are the only two I'm going to talk about, but you can imagine that there's others. Oh, thank you. All right, delete bin, um, decrease key. And we won't talk about uh, make key, we'll just call Dijkstra's algorithm, right? Uh, in an array, what is, it, what is the time it takes to delete the minimum? 
Um, even if you suppose you have a linked list where you can quickly concatenate things, you first have to find the minimum, right? So deleting the minimum in an array takes how long? Well, let's say O of V, but yes, right? In a binary heap, how long does it take to delete the minimum? Pop quiz. Log V, yeah? Why? You pop off the root, and then you do log amount of rearranging the way the binary heap is set up. Um, I'll just make things simpler. We'll just call it V. Uh, decrease key. How long does it take to decrease a key in an array? O of 1? How long does it take to decrease a key in a binary heap? Log V. You got to go to the key and then update it, do a bunch of stuff. Another way you can think about it is you pop it off somewhere deep in there, and then you push it in, and everything rearranges. And it's ugly, but it's still log v. Right. Now, what is the runtime of Dijkstra's algorithm? So how many? what are the operations that we do? Um, well, we do v delete mins. And then what else do we do? We do. Um, for each edge, we could do a de decrease key. So it's going to be E, decrease keys. And then one make queue, which depends on the implementation. But you can ballpark this as a round, um, uh, the insertions operations, which is going to be um, one per vertex, so it's going to be like v uh, log v, well, v insertions. So it's going to be v decrease keys. Right? That's a terrible upper bound, but it is an upper bound. So then what's the runtime of Dijkstra's? It's going to be uh, v delete mins, each costing, in the, in the, if, you use, if you implement Dijkstra's with an array, it's going to cost you v delete mins. So it's going to be v squared, and then e decrease keys, which is going to be o of 1. So it's going to be like uh, o of like uh, v squared plus e plus v decrease keys, which is plus v, right? If you implement Dijkstra's with an array, it costs v squared. Agree? So actually, if the graph is dense, if you have an edge between every pair of vertices, or nearly every pair of vertices, you don't actually gain anything from the priority queue. You're doing so much stuff, you might as well just be using the array. Now what about the binary heap? It's going to be uh, v delete mins, so v log v plus v decrease keys, which is going to be v log v plus uh, e decrease keys, which is going to be log v. So it's going to be v plus e log v plus e log v. Right? So each of these operations costs some time, depending on the data structure you do. V delete mins times V is going to be V log V. E decrease keys cost uh, log V is going to be E V plus E log V. You just pull out the log V. Now, you could compare these two and like what, at what point do they, well, does one get better than the other? But I did that for you. And it's like uh, the binary heap becomes better around E approximately uh, V squared log V, which is not that far off from V squared, but it is still asymptotically different. So when the number of edges falls below this threshold, just a logarithmic term away from uh, V squared, it's better to use the binary heap. Any other case, it's better to use the uh, array. So basically, it's almost most graphs are not dense, though. Most graphs are sparse. It's always better to use binary heap, basically. You won't have to like remember the runtime of Dijkstra's or anything, because it depends upon the implementation. You could have had another column for the Fibonacci heap. You could have had another column, column for a D-ary heap. And that actually is just the binary heap by constants if D is a constant. You could have had um, another column for a binomial heap, or, and so on. So the time change is depending upon the heap implementation. So unfortunately, we, it's a beautiful algorithm, but we, we can't just say, ah, oh, great, some nice number, like we could for DFS, BFS, or every other algorithm we've seen. You know. Any questions so on Dijkstra's algorithm, BFS? Yeah? Right, so v delete mins, each costing log v. So that's v log v. 
E decrease keys, each costing log V. So that's E log V. So that's going to be V plus E log V. Yeah. Uh, this is the number of decreased keys that you can ballpark one make Q by. You could also ballpark it by V. Doesn't really matter. But basically, V decreased keys is a, a decreased key is also an insertion. So like that's the cost it takes to insert something into the array. So you can you can ballpark the make Q operation generically by V insertions. Um, decreased key is also an insertion, right? So delete, decreasing the key and all that, right? More questions on Dijkstra's? Yeah. Uh, that's when the binary heap becomes optimal. Right. Anything less than that, the binary heap is optimal. There's one more question. Uh, how do you decrease a key in an array? You go to the element, and then you decrease the key. Well, in an array, you simply access the ith element, and then you take i takes on i minus whatever, right? Um, so you can suppose that your vertices are indexed 1 through n, and that the, the a of i simply stores the key of this minimum distance of node i. Right? That would work quite simply. If you're doing this in a very vanilla way, that would work. All right, more questions? I can see you guys after class.